I know we're about, if you're watching live or here live, we're a few weeks away from Easter in 2016. But today I want to share a, a, a sermon called Saw and Believed. Saw and Believed. In Christianity, you're supposed to believe before you see. That's really what Christianity is all about. But you're going to see that you and I are not the only ones who maybe have to see sometimes before we believe. A guy named Robert said, everything is theoretically impossible until it is done. Have you ever looked back in your own life and realized that you were able to accomplish stuff that you didn't think you were able to accomplish until you really did it? And then you look back and, and thought, why did I waste all these years thinking that I couldn't accomplish it? Albert Hubbard writes, no one gets very far unless he accomplishes the impossible at least once a day. Just thinking about that earlier, how oftentimes you and I and people don't stretch ourselves to do the things that we don't think that we can do. And so we stretch ourselves to a point sometimes by by reasons that are beyond our control, mm -hmm. that we have to stretch, that we have to do, that we have to, in quotes, perform, when oftentimes we wouldn't have even considered the possibility of doing the things that you see yourself doing these days. Mm -hmm. There's a, a story that I read recently about a guy who is, is building high schools in Kenya to help females achieve greatness. Let me share the story. The idea first came to me, that this, this guy's name is Ben, the idea first came to me while uh, talking with a close friend towards the end of 2008. We were discussing educational th uh, trends in the remote part of Kenya, and it was not pleasing, and the poverty index was very, very high. There's a high percentage of school dropouts, and those who finish only a minute fraction make it to university. The situation of girls is even more dire due to early pregnancies and some lingering cultural issues that he doesn't want to really even talk about, but something had to be done, the story says. A change needed to happen. So out of this talk and some hard work, we founded this girls' high school, which uh, impacted in the first year 98 girls because he saw what was not possible and he saw beyond what the culture said was normal and decided to make changes. Turn over to John chapter 20 in the New Testament of the Bible. We're going to invest quite a few, few minutes here on this, on, on this story. And there's a, there's a pre-story and there's, a, there's a, 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 a segment prior to this. And without going into a tremendous amount of detail, Jesus died on the cross. Before that, he was beaten, he was harassed, he was put through a lot, a lot of tough times. But in John chapter 20, there's the Easter story, in quotes, as some of us have heard over the years. But I want to share some parts of this Easter story in the next half hour or so that will, I think, open up your eyes and my eyes to some things that maybe we, we've glossed over or overlooked over the years. So in John chapter 20, it says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. So Mary Magdalene got up early before the sun rose, came to the tomb to see Jesus, or at least to put some stuff on, on the tomb. But she saw at the end of verse 1 that the stone already was taken from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they had laid him. So in verse 2, her assumption is that somebody stole the body of Jesus Christ. Not that he resurrected, but he was stolen. Verse 3, So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. Verse 4, The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. Pause. Translation into John's language in this year, in the 21st century. Is it possible? Possible that there was some male bragging going on here. I don't know. But the other disciple beat the other disciple. I got there first, you got there second. Ha ha, I beat you. I don't know. So in verse 5, 
he, he was stooping and looking in, and he saw the, the, the clothes that were lying there that Jesus was wrapped in, but he did not go in. Verse 6, and so Simon Peter also came and followed and entered the tomb, and he saw the, the clothing that was lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with those things, but rolled up in a place by itself. So verse 8, so the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. That's the, that's the frame of the text here today. He saw and believed. Verse 9. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. Verse 11. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped in and looked in the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting. One at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they laid him again. The context in her mind is that the, uh, that the body was stolen. In Peter and John's uh, viewpoint, they understood, I think, when they looked in and he was gone, they got it. They saw and believed, the text says. Verse 14. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposed him to be the gardener. And she said to him, Sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned to him and recognized, the story says, that it was in fact Jesus. So in verse number 17, Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your father, and my God, and your God. And then Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples that she has seen the Lord. Now, if you skip down to verse 19, so when the evening on the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, again, in this culture, Jesus was the, the, the Holy One, the one that went counter to the Jewish uh, religion, to say this, this that's been standing for now 2,000 years is old news. We're going to do something different. So if they crucify Jesus, these disciples, these followers of Christ, the closest human beings to Jesus on earth said, or at least thought, that if they could do this to Jesus, then they can do this to me too. So I'm in verse number 19. Because the disciples, for fear of the Jews, then Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be to you. And when he said this, he shared them both hands and both feet. And then he goes on to say that, that I want you to go out and do great things. I want to give you peace. I want to give you the Holy Spirit. So then what, what uh, Luke, Luke kind of changes the story, or maybe not changes, but adds some more detail to the story. In, in chapter 24 in, in Luke, he says in verse 8, And they remembered his words, and they returned to the tomb, and reported all these things to the other disciples and the rest. And now we see it here clearly that Mary Magdalene was one of the first evangelists, if you will, Amen. letting people know who Jesus was and that Jesus rose from the dead. Whereas the guys, the guys that were closest to Jesus, the ones that were viewed higher than women in that culture, were hiding out. Now, it would be very easy for me in this year, in this month, in this day, to throw stones at the disciples saying, man, if I was a son, if I hung out with Jesus, I wouldn't be afraid of anything. That's a bunch of hooey. I think most of us would be terrified knowing of how, how dangerous and how evil the Roman government was and how they crucified people and beat people up and fed them to wild animals and all that. I think all of us would be scared out of our minds. So the, the context in Luke and John's gospel is that, at least in some paraphrases, that uh, Peter and John ran toward the tomb before Mary finished explaining the story, meaning that they were in essence rude, but yet so excited to see what Mary was talking about that they didn't let her finish the whole story. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes you and I have to get so excited that maybe we want to run and see for ourselves and do the things that maybe we haven't thought possible. So John, again, John says that he he, he stooped down, and, and in, in the Greek Latin language, it means to peer into. So in, in, that, in that context, in that Latin language, they had, to, they had to get down, some paraphrase to say, on their knees to see inside the tomb. 
I think oftentimes we have to slow down enough to see the miracles that are all around us, that maybe we have to look at things from a different point of view to see the miracles, to see the godly things, to see what's happening in our lives that maybe we can't see from a certain point of view. There's times when I'll, I'll get silly and get down and play with our, our dog. And when you get down to the eyeball level of a dog and imagine what it looks like from the dog's point of view, it's a whole different mindset about you know, how big human beings are and how threatening human beings are. And life itself is different when you take on the viewpoint from another angle. So in John 20, verse 8, it says that he saw and believed. Or another way to say it in the, in the actual Greek text is, is, is to, they, they looked with understanding. How many times haven't you been to a place in your life when, when you get to a place, then you see? People can tell you about stuff all day long for years and years, but until you experience it, until you see it, until you live it, until you breathe it, sometimes you just don't get it. And I think this is what was happening with Peter and John. So they quickly understood that there was no other explanation for what happened except for Jesus Christ rising from the dead. So over in, again, I'm repeating just a bit, in John 20, verse 6, and so, and so Simon Peter also came following him. Now, if you stop and think about that, just in the prior few years, Peter was the one who was the, the aggressor. Let me use those kind words. He was the one who was the hothead. He was the one who, who thought first, who, who acted first, then thought about what he did. But this time, John was the one who, was, who, who ran faster. I don't know if, if that has any context or, or if that has any meaning, but I thought it was quite interesting. So John beat Peter to the grave, but Peter, but listen, but Peter was the first one who barged in to see what was going on. He, he may have, I don't know, he may have shoved John to the side. Mm -hmm. Maybe John was, at least from my reading of scripture, John was not as um, overt as Peter. He, he was, I hate to use the word softer, he, he was quieter, maybe he was more shy, but he had a huge amount of love in him. Maybe he was a melancholy temperament. I, I don't know, I'm just guessing here. P Peter had some, had some fire in him, so I can imagine Peter shoving John out of the way to, to get a better look of what was happening. So many times in life, reality is achieved before you see the possibility of it. Let me repeat it. Many times in life, reality is achieved before you can see the possibility of it. Story by uh, Benjamin Jenks writes, <clears throat> I've hitchhiked over 22,000 miles around the United States, and I made a, 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 a blog about it, and I love people, and I wanted to help young people and thoughtful adults take bold, massive action so they can be as wise and alive as possible. He, he writes, our culture rewards extroversion and dominance. Think about that. It, they were, it, you see the, the Donald Trumps, the arrogant, the ugly, if I can be political for a second. And a lot of brilliant, shy people never overcome the wall to share their unique message with the world, he writes. The wisdom of these people is the key, listen, to saving our world now. He says there's so much brilliance locked up in unconfident, introverted people. Now, stop and think about this story again with Peter and John. John had a, is very loving. You know, it was obvious that he loved Jesus and Jesus loved him. But how we handle things and how we view things and what we do when we arrive at certain places in our lives can determine whether we get there faster or not. He, he, he writes more. I was a super shy guy, and it has been a huge challenge to create the life that I want. But I did it, and I see a huge window for other thoughtful people can create a life that makes them feel alive and helps save our world. He ends with, I already did survive hitchhiking around the United States, which, by the way, just a P.S., I don't recommend this, okay, it's not safe, I'm not saying that you should do this, but his story, and I will continue traveling around the world, making uh, personal films about everyday people, listen, and coaching shy people on how to spread their, their, their talk or their, their thoughts. And I think oftentimes, 
that you and I think that we have to fit into a certain category, that we have to fit into a certain mold, whereas Mary Magdalene was a woman. In that culture, women were not as important as guys. I'm not suggesting that's how it should be now. I'm not at all. But I'm saying that she was the one, she was the one who let the, the uh, leaders know, the, the, the top of the chain know, if you will, that Jesus wasn't there. She was, as I said before, the first evangelist, really, that, that Jesus was gone. Now, she didn't really, as Scripture says, didn't really understand the whole concept of it, because she thought that somebody stole Jesus' body. But at least she was the one who got Peter and John off their behinds and run to the tomb. And then they were able to believe. Believing stuff before you see stuff seems to be a big key in life. Again, believing stuff before you see stuff is a big key in life. Because oftentimes, you and I don't get moving to where we need to go in life unless we are able to believe it before we see it. And then sometimes we need to see it before we believe it. I, I think both of them go hand in hand depending on, on the actual situation. So it's interesting to me, I think, as well as I think a lot of other people, that I would have run to the same tomb to see proof. Even though I'm sure the disciples heard Jesus say that certain things were going to happen, he was going to rise again on the third day and all that. But I, the older I get the more, more uh, negative I get sometimes, that I, I want to see proof. You know? and, and I understand. I, I understand why Peter and John may have run to the tomb. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a story, you may have heard of him, a guy named Stevie Wonder. Stevie, he, he, he received 22 Grammy Awards, at least as of a couple years ago, uh, over his 51-year career. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he never saw any of them. He never saw any of them. Now, can, can you imagine somebody being born blind and people telling him that you have a great voice and you have talent, but you can't see it, you can't smell it, you, you, you can't taste it until time happens? Imagine if you and I would believe before we see. Imagine if you and I would embrace the potential and the possibilities of what could be before we actually see it. A guy named Ludwig van Beethoven was deaf about halfway through his career of creating music. So many of his musical ensembles were created when he couldn't even hear them because he was able to see it before he was able to really enjoy it. What we see, listen, what you see and hear can be a distraction. What you see and hear can be a distraction. I, for those who don't know, I'm very musical. I play the piano, and I've been musical for a very long time, decades. And I have to be extremely, extremely careful what music I allow in my ears. It, it, some people don't understand it, but being musical, that when a song is in your head, a song is in your head for a very long time, which means you can't get that song, I can't get that song out of my head to focus on more important things. So again, what you see in here can be a distraction. So I have, for me, just, for, I can't speak for you, but for me, I have to be really careful. Um, Matthew got a uh, record player uh, less than a year ago or so, and he has all these albums of a variety of kinds and, and styles. And almost every few days, I have to tell him, Matt, I need you to turn it down because I'm trying to work, but yet I hear XYZ music going to my ear, and then I and then all day I'm hearing this this beat, this song. That's what distracts me from stuff that I need to do. How many times haven't you been distracted from things that you need to do because you're not being very proactive about allowing or not allowing stuff into your eyes and into your ears? So again, I go back to John 20 verse 6, and so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb. And he saw the, the clothes that was there and, and the face cloth that had been on his head, not lying with the, with the other things, but rolled in a place by itself, verse 8. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed. Now that just, that just if I could read into that just a little bit, sometimes you and I have to be the first person in mm -hmm. for other people to follow. So if you and I are standing outside of opportunity, and I, I, I believe this with my heart and soul, that when some of us are standing outside of opportunity or outside of, of, of an open door, that we're actually potentially blocking other people from walking in that same door. So even though for us it's terrifying to take that step, to take that leap, then sometimes when you take that leap or that, that step, that encourages others to enter the place where you are and then branch out to do other 
things that maybe they want to do. I think that's, that is, is uh, transferable in everyday life. I'll say it a different way. That when, we're stop, when we don't do the things that we're supposed to do, oftentimes we're stopping other people from doing the things that they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. there, there's a guy named Nathan uh, Stook, S-T-O-O-K-E. He's, he has, he's a very different kind of impossible, the story says. He overcame not only a physical challenge, but an intellectual one. By the time he was in elementary school, he found himself falling further and further behind his other students. And in third grade, all the other kids blossomed, but he says, I just didn't. This Illinois businessman, now 37, while every out, everyone else was diving into the pleasures of reading, he could barely sound out the letters of his alphabet. When he started that fall at a new school, the teacher asked him to write down his preferred nickname, and young Nate laboriously wrote N-A-T, Nat. And so for the rest of the year, everyone, uh, everybody called him Nat. That kind of thing was an everyday occurrence, he says. So were countless other petty humiliations, all of which added up to a constant feeling of failure. I really felt that school was a waste of time. He says, I felt like I was doing all this work and not getting anything out of it. Eventually, he was diagnosed with dyslexia, and he was assigned to a special class. There he found many of his fellow students had given up on learning. So he says that, that, had been, that really saved his life to look at things from a different point of view. So by the end of sixth grade, he was close to despair, and here I was, putting in three or four times as much work as anybody else and getting nothing out of it, he recalls. I had to wonder how far I'm going to go in life anyway. Then in the seventh grade, he woke up. He realized that he was able to do things differently and better by just by tweaking a little things how he learned and how he studied. So there, the point, I guess, in the example is there's always a way. The way is, I think, harder for some of us, but there's always a way. He says he, he, he didn't have to uh, do painstaking painstakingly transforms his self-doubt. Thanks to his mother's iron will, he says, whatever your goal is, it has to be connected to something bigger. That, that's why I want to share it over the years, that your why has to be bigger than what you're going through, because the why gets you up out of bed, right? Mm -hmm. He says, from then on, he says, I never look back. He, he, he racked up straight A's through high school and college, but he could no longer curse his bad luck. Instead, he had a, he had a new attitude. He changed the way he looked at himself thus changing the way stuff was happening. So Mary Magdalene ran to the disciples, assuming one thing, that maybe, maybe, just maybe, maybe, Peter and John ran to the tomb, assuming another, or expecting something else. I wonder how many of us are maybe intimidated about approaching people, maybe at work or the neighborhood, when you don't know that your word, your encouragement, your comment, whatever you want to call it, could open up an opportunity for them and just a way of thinking that was that could be extraordinary for them. So again, if, if, if we go back to John chapter 20, so the other disciple, the other disciple came in. How many times have it you stood in the way? I'll say it three or four times because I think it's important. How many times have it you stood in the way because of your fear and your intimidation of other people realizing what they were born to do, realizing greatness in their lives, or at least experiencing an opportunity that maybe you didn't think was even possible. You know, I want to back up for maybe three days. If, 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 if you go, go back to Mark chapter 14, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 15, in verse number 42 in Mark chapter 15, let's just back up a bit, because there's a story here that is glossed over by most of us for a long time. Mark chapter 15, verse 42. Now, this is... Prior to, this is about three days prior to what I just shared with you in John chapter 20. Mark 15, starting in verse number 42. Now this is after Jesus had died. The, 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 the scriptures say that Jesus surrendered his spirit and died. Verse 42. When evening had come, because it was the preparation day, which is the holy day, Joseph, in verse 43 of Arimathea, came, a prominent member of the council, the Jewish council, by the way, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, and he gathered up the courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Now let me just pause for a moment here. If he was part of the Jewish high council, he was known. He was 
Many commentators say that he was very wealthy. If this guy had the courage to go to Pilate, I, I think this is a tremendous step because then he would be potentially identified as one of the followers of Jesus. Right. He was putting his neck on the line for the body of Jesus. He, he got really, could really get nothing out of it, but he stuck his neck out there. So the story can, continues. If, if, you go, if you switch over to Matthew 27, it shares a little different way. Matthew 27, 57. Matthew 27, 57. When the evening was came, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself has also become a disciple of Jesus. Now let me just pause and think about this. He's on the Jewish High Council. He couldn't say anything because that would give himself away that he's a follower of Jesus. But yet, in verse number 58, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and Pilate ordered it to be given to him. Now, again, if you go to, I know I'm skipping around quite a bit, but I'm trying to give you the whole story because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John share it in just a little slightly different light. So in John 19, verse 38, it says, After these things, Joseph was of Arimathea in John 19, 38. But a secret one for fear of the Jews. This is John talking in John 19, verse number 38. Slowing down a little bit. John 19, 38. But for fear, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Now stop. For me, just stop and think about this. When you and I have influence, when you and I have earned the right to ask what we want, stuff happens. Good stuff happens, I think, sometimes. But for you and I that choose not to, earn, to work hard enough to earn the right to get your big ask, A-S-K, A-S-K, make sure you hear what I'm saying, that you sometimes, you and I, have the right to ask the big ask because we've paid the dues ahead of time mm -hmm. to ask the big ask. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Pilate got that. I wonder if Pilate wasn't even suspicious that Joseph of Arimathea was a secret follower of Christ. He knew, he knew him as a guy in, in the upper level of the Jewish hierarchy. So Joseph may not have even had to maybe let that secret out that he was a secret follower, but he earned, again, he earned the right. I believe that hard work over years gives you the right to do certain things, to give you the right to ask for certain things in your own life. So Joseph of Arimathea knew that most of the bodies that were crucified were just left there to rot and for the wild animals to come, because there's stories in ancient texts I've read that describe what happens to the bodies on the crosses. It's not a pretty scene. Hmm. So Joseph, being a follower of Jesus, loved Jesus so much that he didn't want to see that happen to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering, too, if Joseph of Arimathea knew what was going to happen in three days. I'm not sure. I, I couldn't really mm -hmm. find all that out. But I'm wondering if there was another motive and maybe he placed him in a place in his own tomb that he paid for, knowing that it was going to be a short-term lease anyway. Mm. You know, he wasn't he wasn't given that tomb away. He knew that it was just 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 a night, you know, a three-day event that he was going to be able to use it in the next thirty years when he passed away or whatever it was. It, it was a short-term. Maybe he knew that. I don't know. But all I do know is that he went up to Pilate, the guy who, who gave the final word to crucify Jesus Christ, and said, you know what, I, I, I really, I know the culture and the system is to leave him up on the crosses to rot, but I'd like to have his body. Mm -hmm. And he asked. Mm -hmm. And he got. And I think sometimes you and I forget that there's always risk to asking. There's always risk to sticking your neck out so far when you don't know the person on the other side is not waiting there with an axe to get rid of your risk. There was also a risk for, for Mary and Peter and John to go to, to the tomb, if you stop and think about that. There were guards at the tomb. Wouldn't it be common not knowledge that if people who went to the tomb must have been followers of Christ, so the soldiers had the power potentially to arrest and or to kill these followers of Christ that were trying to find the body of Jesus? I'm, I'm just assuming. 
but they also had a risk just to go to the tomb. So there's, there's an art of believing before you see. There's an art of believing before you see. And a, a big part of that, I think 90% of it or more, is all about trusting the one that you're believing, whether it's a human being or God or something else, or a goal or a mission in life or whatever it is. That, that belief and that seeing have to go hand in hand at some point. Gandhi said, strength doesn't come from, from how you can handle yourself physically, but, but it comes from will, having, having a strong will. And I, I think that Peter's personality and his strong will, as, as we read throughout the, at least a good part of the New, New, New Testament, was one of those characteristics that, was able, that enabled him to touch the lives of thousands of people around the world over a couple thousand years. So I think one, one of the biggest implications for me is there, that there's a power that none of us can imagine that will enable us to do things that we right today can't even see. Mm -hmm. And I'll repeat it four or five times now, but oftentimes the things you don't get are the things you don't ask for enough times and, and, and in different ways. And I, I am tempted to go down and share other examples, but and you can really think about it in your own life. That sometimes you didn't get certain things in your life until 10 years later because you didn't have the courage to ask for them in a variety of different ways. So don't be afraid to ask for them, whatever those things are, in a variety of different ways because you just may get them. So there's, there's the, also there's implications to this story is what is truly possible. How many times haven't you said in your own mind, maybe in your own heart, that this is impossible, or this can't be achieved, or I, I can't accomplish this, or what I really want in life is not even possible. Well, it's, it's these days, there's not too much that's not possible. If you stop and think about where we live these days and what, what is possible. So again, I go back to John chapter 19. And after, in John 1938, verse it says, and after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for the fear of the Jews asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And now another text says that, that Pilate didn't even know that Jesus was dead yet. Mm -hmm. So not, not another text says that, that Pilate had to go find out first, or he sent somebody to, to find out if Jesus was dead first, then he gave the body over to Joseph. So what if someone, what if some of the things that, that you want to accomplish and people in your life because they haven't worked hard enough and earned the right, as I said before, for you to ask and for them to give that power to you or to give what you're asking for. Some people, I, I think, are just waiting for you and I to have the courage to ask for what we really want. And some people are willing to give a lot more for what you want to accomplish, but we're sometimes too afraid to even ask. What if many people choose not to pay the price to be able to see what they want and believe there's a way to get it because there's always a price to pay to get what you want. There's always a price to pay to see what you believe or believe what you see. Mm. It's not easy. Life, life is all uphill. Uh, uh, Harry Brown writes, everything you want in life has a price connected to it. Again, everything you want in life has a price connected to it. There's a price to pay if you want to make things better, a price to pay just for leaving things as they are, and there's a price for everything. I've said before over the pulpit, that I've run into people in a, a couple of different places that didn't feel like doing certain things at the moment they were doing them, but they did them anyway because they knew they had to do them, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Because sometimes we are tempted to rely on our emotions whether or not we feel like doing something. Feelings have to be taken off the table if we really want to get stuff done in our lives. Mm -hmm. Andrew Jackson writes, you must pay the price if you wish to secure a blessing. Again, you must pay the price if you wish to secure a blessing. I go back to John 20, verse 8. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed. I wonder if there's people right around you waiting for you. Forgive the, the uh, irreverent connotation. But I wonder if there's people around you that are waiting for you to resurrect from your mediocrity, or your doubt, or your fear to have the courage to do the things that maybe they couldn't do before. Because remember, when Jesus rose again, 
and he came to the disciples, and they saw and believed. Even Thomas, who had to be, you know, I'm not going to believe unless he what, puts his finger, you know, in, 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 in the wounds, right? So he says, until I see it. So he saw it, and then he believed. And then the whole world was totally changed because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So if, if we can maybe tone that down just a little bit. I wonder if there's people looking at us in our lives, waiting for us to step up to do the things that maybe we should have been doing 25 years ago that we've been afraid to do or that we've been concerned about what people are going to think or what people are going to believe or what people are going to view us in a certain light. Who are you on all that? What if you and I choose to do the things that we're supposed to be doing, thus freeing other people in our lives that maybe have been watching and waiting for us to do the things that we're supposed to be doing? Does it make any sense at all? Amen. I hope it does. What if you and I, what if you and I believe in order to see? What if you and I believe in order to see? A guy named Ralph Ramson writes, before the reward there must be labor. Before the reward there must be labor. He says, you plant before you harvest. You sow in tears before you reap in joy. Sometimes we, I know young people, woo, especially young people, they, they expect the opposite. They expect to reap before they sow. They expect to have all the things mom and dad have before they even work 10% of the years and the time and the effort and the tears that mom and dad have. Jim Rohn wrote, for every promise there is a price to pay. For every promise, for everything that you want, for every, for every resurrection, if you will, there needs to be a price. Somebody, somebody's got to, there's, there's a price that needs to be, be paid. So in, in, in John chapter 20, now, if you go down in the story, remember I said moments ago that, that Jesus appeared and Thomas wasn't there the first time he came back, Jesus and Thomas was there. So in verse 28 of John 20, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus said to Thomas, I'm in John 20, 28, because you have seen me, you have believed. And then Jesus goes on one more sentence. He says, blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Blessed are they who did not see and believed. So throughout the whole Bible, this is the foundation really of the Bible, and, and that is not seeing and yet believing. If you go through the Old Testament story, and I could be here two hours to go through it, we're not, uh, going through every story or almost every story sharing, and if, whether it's Joshua, whether it's Caleb, whether it's uh, a number of other, David, I mean, there's so many, right? That Jeremiah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm now going down that road, but we're going to stop right there with Jeremiah. But there's story after story that, that says that you know, before you see, believe what's possible. Or remember, I asked, or may, maybe you were born for such a time as this. You know, if you speak out, even if you're sticking your neck way out there, maybe the purpose of you sticking your neck out there, in Esther's case, could be to free thousands of people. Yes? So we, we, we have faith all the time. We get in the car and we turn the key and expect the car to run, right? Mm -hmm. we, we expect the car to take us from A to B. We, we take uh, schooling and, and we expect to get a degree after we pay the price, lots of prices, and, and do the work and the time and effort. We expect the reward for it. So deciding to see before you believe has stopped millions of people from moving forward in life. Let me say it again. Deciding to see before you believe has stopped millions of people from moving forward in life. I'll say it one more time. Deciding to see before you believe has stopped millions of people from moving forward in life. I would say, just in my own personal studies, that that accounts for about 98% of people. That, that they have to see before they believe, which enables them to take the step forward or not. Whereas the 2% of the people, they say, even though I can't see it, I believe that it's going to be possible, so I'm going to take the steps that I need to take consistently in order to do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. So your training and my training, my belief structure and yours also, are reflected in how and what you're able to see in life. I mean, there's so many times when I've been taught by younger people stuff that I didn't see. I didn't even think about it. But they had the courage to open up and share information that now transformed me to look at things and did differently. And then eight times out of ten or so, I made changes in my life to reflect that new information. Well, I wonder how many of us, maybe you, maybe me, 
are afraid to share this new information with people in our lives, which then could, in essence, give them a springboard to move forward and do things that they haven't really thought possible. So again, Peter and John believed when they saw, but yet Jesus told Thomas, blessed are those who believe and didn't see. That's right. So the expectations that you and I have, listen, the expectations that you and I have form our beliefs. The expectations that you and I have form our beliefs. One more time. The expectations that you and I have form our beliefs. So what do you believe? Let me say it a different way. What you believe could happen will determine your actions before you even see what can happen, if that makes any sense. And again, I could go down many examples. Joseph um, Hillenan writes, not only do we tend to see what we expect to see, we also tend to experience what we expect to experience. <laughs> One recent study asked a group of radiologists to examine, listen to this, a series of x-rays, fascinating story, just as they would if they were looking for lung cancer. Unknown to the radiologists, though, the researchers had inserted into the x-rays a picture no professional would ever expect to see, a picture of a gorilla. The picture of the gorilla wasn't tiny. It was about 45 times the size of an average cancerous lung nodule, or about the size of a matchbook in your lung. How many radiologists spotted the gorilla? Very few. Some 83% of the radiologists missed the gorilla, even though eye tracking showed most of them had been looking right at it. And this story is repeated in a variety of different forms. We see what we're looking for. Think about this. We see what we're looking for. Well, I was, uh, Lindsay and I were out yesterday, and uh, she, I was paying attention for the first time in a long time to the road in front of me. Uh, where we were going, and she got, said, she, she goes, deer. I wasn't paying attention to what, of course, I should have been paying attention to what she was saying because we were discussing things in the car, but she said, deer. I didn't hear the deer. She said, Dad, did you see the deer? I said, what deer? I was focused, well, I was focusing where, I, where I'm going, right? So where we focus is where our attention goes. Mm -hmm. So if our attention is in a certain place, then we're not going to see the other stuff. Maybe we should have, maybe we should widen our view as the example, the point I'm trying to make here. We should widen our example, uh, our, our viewpoint, just a little bit to see things that maybe we've been ignoring, or maybe we've been trying to see things th th this way. An opportunity says that we need to see things this way. So again, Joseph of Arimathea, back to the scriptures, had the expectation, soon to close, had an expectation or a belief structure that he was going to receive, in this case, the body of Jesus, what he was asking, because he, he wouldn't have asked if he didn't think he was going to get the body of Jesus, right? So many times have we not believed that what we were asking we were going to get, mm -hmm. whereas Joseph of Arimathea believed that he was, in fact, going to get the body of Jesus. Right. So as I close, there's a, there's a few lessons here, I think, for all of us. What are you expecting to happen in your life? What are you expecting to happen in your life? Number two, what do you believe is going to happen in your life? What are you expecting? What do you believe is going to happen? And are you, are you looking for what you expect and believe to happen in your life? Mm -hmm. You're going to find, I think, more times than not, that getting a yes to what you're trying to get to happens a lot faster the more times you ask. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even talking about, you know, prayer or asking, seeking, and knocking. I'm, I'm not really talking about that specifically. I'm talking about life, that the more you ask, the more you do, the more you expect, the more you're going to get. Because somebody said that if you, if you don't ask, you're not going to receive, right? Last question, what, what proactive steps are you taking daily to move toward the expectation and your belief? What proactive steps are you taking consistently? Again, I could share personal examples all day. Last question. Will you see then believe or believe then see what you want to happen in your life? That's a question I can't ans answer for you. I can suggest that in order for us to get what we expect, 
then we need to see it before we get it. Because mm. if we don't see it before we get it, then how are we going to identify it when it shows up on the scene for us to embrace, for us to grab, for us to really leverage in our own lives and for the benefit of other people in our lives? Mm.